ready to see Moshe Rabbeinu and engage the issue. We are going to tell us that. The Rav says that he was trying to arouse amongst them a sense of B'nai Eliyav. Look at your pedigree. Look at your lineage. Look where you're coming from. But nothing seemed to help. Das Mavirim were bent on leading this rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu. And there are lessons that we can learn from this parasha, which are very, very important. When Moshe Rabbeinu picks himself up later, we find Moshe Rabbeinu, we find Dasim Aviram saying to Moshe Rabbeinu very, very terrible words. <speaking in Hebrew> you didn't bring us to a land of Eretz Yisrael like you promised, to a beautiful land, a nachla sod of a korem. Ha'ene ha'anashim ha'em tenake. Lo'inale, they repeated again. The eyes of these men, you can gouge out, but we ain't going up. That's a very interesting expression. What were they saying here? The eyes of these people, these men, meaning themselves, you can gouge out. There's an important point that they're making. You know, we try to correct other people's visions. Sometimes we see things in a certain way, and we are certain, we are sure that we have it right. And when we're on that pathway, it becomes an extension of ourselves. We cannot see outside our own little box. We have to see it our way. And Dasim Aviram was saying exactly that. Moshe Rabbeinu, you can bring the most compelling argument. We can even know that Hashem is sending you to tell it to us. But our eyes are fixed. You could gouge them out and we'll still see the same. Loi nala. We won't go up. This is a very deep strain inside each and every one of us that we have to recognize and acknowledge. We don't see straight. And sometimes, because we don't see straight, we become invested in our way of looking at things and we're sure we're right. The tzaddikim, the greats of each generation, are called the Eine Ha'eda. They're the eyes of the generation. And it is they, when we see through their eyes, that we're able to correct our eyes. There's an imperfection in our eyes. We find the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu just a little bit further after he prescribes to them what is going to happen, what terrible punishment is going to befall them, and how they're going to be tested. And it says... Moshe Rabbeinu said to everybody, and he says, Remove yourself from the tents of these wicked people. Everybody removes themselves from Dalsim Babiram. And then the Torah says, Moshe Rabbeinu picked himself up and he actually went to Dalsim Babiram. An amazing thing. Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayokom Moshe, Vayelech el Dosen Baviram. Moshe Rabbeinu picks himself up, and he goes to Dosen Baviram, Vayelchu Achrov, Zikna Yisrael. Who couldn't see Moshe Rabbeinu going and not following him? And they all stand in front of Dosen Baviram. And Dosen Baviram is standing outside with his family, outside his tent. The Torah describes... Dasim Aviram are standing very strong outside their tents, recalcitrant. It's on their faces. Stick me. You ain't going to make me budge. Heim, it's them. Pesach Aleim, Unashayim, Ubneim, Vatapam. They had their whole family, the whole tribe with them. Moshe Ravina picks himself up. The Gemara tells us that you see the Anivus, the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Gemara tells us in Yuma Daf Pezayin that there was a butcher that made the life of Rav very difficult. And he was Mavazahim, he abused Rav. And Rav knew that this butcher had to ask for Mechila, had to ask for forgiveness. But he wasn't coming. The butcher was a very egotistical person, very self centered. He's not coming to Rav. And so on the of Yom Kippur, Rav picked himself up and he went to the butcher and he stood outside his store. And as he stood outside his store, he was hoping, obviously, that the butcher will use the opportunity seeing Rav. It's the of Yom Kippur. Maybe something will be aroused within him. I'll ask for, for Mechila. The butcher saw him and the butcher says to him, I'm not coming to you. Don't think that you make any difference to me. 
And as he picked up his knife to chop the bones that he was chopping, the meat that he was chopping, the handle fell off, dislodged itself from the blade, and the blade stuck itself in his neck, and he died. That's what the Gemara tells us. Now, we understand that Rav, in his great humility, wanted to facilitate for this butcher that he should ask for Mechila. But in truth, there's something perhaps a little bit deeper. Rav, the great leader of his generation, has something exuding from him. Every godel, when you're in the presence of a great person, there's a revelation, there's clarity. The soul is enlightened. Something lights up. We're in the presence of greatness. It connects to our neshama, and we're able to see a little bit bigger, a little bit greater. That's human nature. We feel elevated. We're able to realign our real values. But that's all if we are receptive to that light. We have to have the eyes that are willing to see the light that comes from our teachers. We want to correct our lenses. But if we switched off and we say, we know best, don't tell us what to do. The rabbis, they're all just in it for themselves. Whatever comes forth the lens will stay inverted and we'll never see. The, you know, there was a uh, the famous when they sent up the Hubble telescope. They invested, NASA invested billions of dollars <laughs> and they were looking forward to this incredible experiment, the biggest telescope imaginable in the sky that was going to be able to beam from billions of light years away the most distant galaxies they were going to see amazing pictures, and they were sitting with bated breath on the day that finally, a few hours after the telescope was up there, they were waiting to see the pictures coming back to Mother Earth. And they were terribly disappointed. NASA had a t- tremendous egg on its face. The lens, the primary lens, the refractory lens, that they'd invested millions and millions of dollars in and spent over a year, the big company that made it, had the tiniest, tiniest minor imperfection a fraction, an infinitesimal fraction of a millimeter was off the curvature. It was slightly curved, and therefore the light that came from distant planets wasn't beamed. All the pictures were coming back fuzzy, and they weren't coming back clean. It was a terrible disappointment. It was a a terrible embarrassment. Finally, there was a scientist that realized that this is the only way, that a great engineer realized the only way we're going to be able to correct this is <clears throat> we send up a spaceship with another lens that has the exact same imperfection, but it's facing the other way. We install it opposite the lens that is curved the wrong way, and that will correct the images. It will balance it, and then we'll have the perfect images. That's what they did. They spent millions, if not billions of dollars on this. And a year and a half, two years later, they were able to install the camera, and they came back the most incredible pictures. And I was thinking about this. That's mamish, mamish, what the Rebunshim wants from us. We have to know our lens is inverted. The Torah HaKadosh tells us, Loisoso min hadova ashe yagidu lecha yomin usmoel. Don't veer from that which the sages, that which our leaders tell us, yom and a smile, not to the right, not to the left. Chazal say, I feel if they tell you that your right is your left and your left is your right, whatever they say goes. What do you mean? A tzaddik, a great rabbi tells me, my right hand is my left hand, my left hand is my right hand. What am I going to tell him? Ralph, with all due respect, you're hallucinating. It's not true. My right is my right hand. My left is my left hand. No. I see my right hand as my right hand, my left and my left, because I'm here. And I'm invested in self. But he who's facing me knows that my right is my left, and my left is my right. I have to see it from his perspective, because he defines reality. He is the Enayim, the eyes that see it through the prism of Shemayim, from up there, not from down here. We find the most fascinating thing when Yaakov Avinu is benching Ephraim and Menashe, and he's Sikiles Yadav, he moves his hands in the opposite direction, and Yosef tells 
tries to take his hands and put his right hand on Menashe, the Bukhur, and his left hand on Ephraim. And what does Yaakov say to him? Your dati bini your dati. I know, my son, I know. I know who's the Bukhur. But nevertheless, he's very great. Menashe is very great. But Ephraim will be Yigdal Mimen, it will be greater than him. I know what I'm doing. And the commentaries all touch upon this double expression. Yodati bini yodati. I know, my son, I know. What's that double expression? And the Sfarim say, Yodati, I know what you know, but I know something more. Yodati bini, my son, I know everything you know, but Yodati, I know more. It's very hard for us to accept that others know more than us. It challenges us. Our entire ego is at stake. We're invested in the way we see it. And we're sure that we are right. What do you mean? You're going to tell me you're not in touch with the times. We hear some things that are being said maybe by Gedolim, by Tzadikim, by Edmoirim, by Rosh Hashivas that lead the generation. And we say, what do they mean? This is not possible. What if they're not in touch with reality? We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do the other. I see it from my perspective, and I think I know it. But I have to know, even if I'm not ready for total compliance, at least I need to know that my lens is inverted. My lens is warped. My lens is invested in I. And it needs to be corrected. And they see things from a higher perspective. I saw the most, heard the most amazing story from Rabbi Shor Simcha Shor, Rabbi Shor Shlita. He said over that the Skuleni Rebbe, Zalazan Kazunt and Shtak, he should live and be well, was in Antwerp, and he was there for a, uh, for a, uh, he went there for a few days, Simcha, I'm not sure, but he had to stay for a few weeks. He was not well, he had to go into hospital when he was there. And he was there staying at this balabas, this well-to-do nugget, very important balabas in Antwerp. He was staying in his home. And when it was finally a couple of days before he was about to leave, his gaboim told him, Rebbe, he said, you know, we've stayed here in this person's house. You know what it is when a Rebbe stays in the house, the cooking, the baking, the people coming and going, the whole house is interrupted. So we have to give him a gift. We have to give him a gift. Now they were thinking of this big, probably this huge silver vase with a nice inscription on it or a picture, a plaque. I don't know what they were thinking. The Rebbe said to them, no, 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 don't worry. I gave him already. I gave him a gift already. Don't worry. They were thinking, what? The Rebbe gave a gift? We don't know about it. What kind of gift did the Rebbe did he give? <laughs> so they went over to the Yid and they said, Rebbe, the Rebbe gave you a gift. What did he give you? So he said, I don't know. I, I didn't receive anything. I don't know about anything. So he went back to the Rebbe. The Rebbe he said, Rebbe, he doesn't know what, 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 what do you mean? What, what, what gift did you give? He said, nein, nein. Letzte Woche haben geschickt zwei emistige Anim from Yerushalayim. Last week I sent him two real genuine poor people from Yerushalayim. <laughs> To him, that's the greatest gift. Now, <laughs> it's not, he didn't mean it, he, didn't, he wasn't saying this. This was an absolute palpable reality to him, that he was mazaka him. He gave him a passport to Olam Abba by sending him two genuine and him, real and him. We see it like, come on. We see it from our perspective. We, we think we know reality. We understand that Chazal tell us, O boy said bok. To him you shall cleave. Hidovek betalmide chachomim. If we want to cleave to Hashem, we have to cleave to talmide chachomim. We have to learn from them. We have to try and absorb from them. We have to try and connect to them in any which way. We have to try and do business with them. We have to give them a ride. We have to try and marry off our children into their family. And we think, you know, okay, I'm supposed to learn from them. You know, when we're in the presence of greatness, something connects 
and we're able to see things straight. We're able to see reality. We're able to take ourselves out from the, the real world, quote-unquote, the perceived real world, and see things with real clarity. And when we follow what they say, we're connected to the source of truth. My Rebbe, the uh, Slam Rebbe Yerushalayim, one of his chassidim had a challenge with a, um, an apartment and he had to go to court and there was a neighbor or he did some construction or he changed something but a neighbor hauled him into court and he was facing a very difficult secular woman judge in the Jerusalem magistrate's court and he didn't know what to do so he went to the rebbe and the rebbe told him, he said, you know, he took out a Gemara, he heard the case and he said he took out a Gemara in Baba Basra and he showed him in the Gemara a very similar exact situation and the Gemara ruled exactly like what he wanted, you know, that the, the, there wasn't any problem of Hezek Re'ir in this, in this circumstance or whatever it was. And he said, tell the judge, bring the Gemara and show the judge the Gemara. And he thought to himself, what? <laughs> Rabbi, <laughs> he couldn't bring himself to do it. Went to court <laughs> and he just couldn't couldn't, you know, like, what, I'm going to tell this judge of Gemara, she's going to laugh, I'm going to be the laughing stock of the whole courtroom, I can't do it. <laughs> so he went with his lawyer, and he starts different stratagems, and he sees it's not going anywhere. And f- f- at the, he saw at the end he was going to lose, he asked for an adjournment, he has one more piece of evidence to bring in, he asked for a, a postponement for the case. Anyway, he went back to, his, to the Rebbe, he said, Rebbe, he said, I, I couldn't do it, you know, like, it just wasn't appropriate, but I see I'm going to lose. So the Rebbe said, told you what to do, just do it, you know, what's the problem? So the next time he went back to court, and he pulled himself together, and he comes in with a big marble of a basra, <laughs> and he says, uh, Your Honor, he said, I'd like to quote you from the Talmud, and he quotes the Gemara, and she said to him, straight in the face, she said, that's what the Talmud rules? Okay, then that's what we're going to rule. Mm-hmm. And she ruled right away. I think, I, really? <laughs> You know, there's an energy in MS. When we're revealed to the MS, we can see things from an entirely different perspective. There's a power to a moment of MS that is very powerful. And sometimes it's true, we're revealed to MS and we think we did the right thing, we followed the instruction of a goddle, so we should be right there on the pathway to total success. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes a great person can tell us something, and we can lose money. It doesn't have to be that they say exactly what we want and what we hear. I have a relative, actually. He followed his Rav's direction, his Rebbe's direction, in a particular business dealing, and he went bankrupt. And he said to me, you know, I'm so happy because I know that Hashem wanted me to go bankrupt. But if I would have done it myself, I would have made that decision. I would have always been killing myself. I heard it from my rabbi. I know that's exactly what Hashem wants. That's Emes. Emunus Chachamim. The hardest challenge that we have, you know, we can have Emunah in Hashem. The Sfasemes says, Vayaminu Bashem Ubamoisha Avdei. The Jewish people realized a level of not just trusting and believing in Hashem, but believing that he sent messengers down here that reflect his presence and his deya. And he's the, they are the Ene Ho'eda. Vayaminu Bashem, and even more than that, Obamosha Avdoi. Emunas Chachamen. It's even greater than Emunah in Hashem. But we have to have our receptors, we have to have our Bluetooth switched on. We have to be in receiving mode. We have to be able to listen and to hear and to recognize that we are inherently flawed. We're invested in I. Our lens is curved a little bit towards us. And that warps everything. And only one that sees it from up above, from Hashem's perspective, will be able to straighten us out. And when we're in receiving mode, we actually catch the beams. It lifts us up. We're able to actually not simply follow dutifully. It corrects our lens. It gives us a means, oh boy, Sidbach, to connect Hashem. The Mesil Sisharim gives it a muscle like there's a maze 
in the king's palace, there's a maze that you just, there's no way of getting out. And then someone's right there on top and he tells us, you know, move straight, go here, go there. There's someone that sees things from a much higher perspective, much higher to Hashem. They see things differently. Dustin Vavun had that opportunity and they said, no, you can gouge out our eyes. We are not going to see. Loinala! We're not going up. Loinala! There are many in our generation that say, don't tell me what to do. I will do what I want to do. And in order to assert the I, they will cast aspersions and all kinds of innuendo they will throw towards those that are the anyhoid of the leaders of a generation. We have to know that we are imperfect. We're inherently imperfect. And Hashem Shoslon Becholder puts leaders in each generation to give us the corrective lens to tell us how we need to act. And it's true, we're not perfect. We may not always be able to follow their directives, but at least let's know that our eyes are flawed and this is the correct pathway and we aspire to realize true and total emunas kachamim. Good Shabbos. Shabbos. You can switch off the camera, Asha. Thank you. Okay, there was more to be said, but... The story of Rabbi Aaron Kotler. He was a, such an incredible, great person. And um, Ramosha Shera really followed everything he said. That was his Rebbe move. He never moved without him. And in 1962, it was the beginning when they were able to get, uh, they went to Kennedy. There was a delegation going to. President Kennedy to advocate on behalf of some support for private schooling. I don't call if it was vouchers or busing or some, some kind of recognition for some funding, federal funding for private schools. And Rabbi Aaron told him, go. There was a delegation of priests, Catholic priests going from the archdiocese, from the Catholic archdiocese. And Rabbi Aaron told him it was the first time there was any collaboration between the uh, Catholic world and the Jewish world after that there was more and more, he was very close with Cardinal O'Connor but he told him you, you, you should go, so he said to Rabban he said to Rabban, he said I need help, I need to know what to say, he was going with three other bishops or cardinals he said I need to know what to say it was right after, the meeting was right on Tisha B'av, right after Tisha B'av, Rabban said I don't have time, you call me Leil Tisha B'av. after Kinnis, call me I have time then that was the only time he had. You know, he figured in his Das Torah, he understood that this needs to be, you know, in a time where he can't learn anyway, that's a time where he'll deal with this. So he called him Lel Tishbov. It was very much, it was right before the meeting. I think they were meeting on Tishbov. And Rab Aaron spent with him an hour and a half, and he went through exactly what to say and what to anticipate as questions and how to answer it. It was different than what he would have thought of said, thought to say, but he said it. He came to the meeting, they entered, they came into the White House, and he said afterwards, Rob Aaron must have had heavenly vision, because exactly what the president asked, I knew exactly what to answer, those were the questions, and I said exactly when I wrote, on, I said it. And Kennedy said afterwards, he said to the meeting, he said, <laughs> He said to the cardinals, he said, you all said very good, but the rabbi from Brooklyn, he said the best. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they were successful in actually breaking that wall, that brick wall between church and state, that they were able to finally get some, some recognition or some federal funding and know exactly what it was. But, you know, when we follow, we ask, we follow. Marbe Eitzah, Marbe Chachma, we think, you know, we all know it all. It's the hardest thing to ask advice. And it's certainly the hardest thing to ask advice from someone who we look at as, you know, okay, Rabbi, okay, but you're not in the real world. What do you know? And sometimes the advice may sound, might sound that doesn't relate to us. If we follow, we're secure. Very important.
what's maybe anything else? The concept and the greatness of Karach. If he had such an uh, amazing following in such a generation, you can imagine that this wasn't an ordinary person. And yet, he couldn't surrender himself to leadership. It's the hardest thing. I've seen very, very great people. I've seen wonderful people that can give good advice. And yet, when it comes to themselves, the lens is slightly inverted. Then so they cannot they see to, the forest from the trees. So that, that, that means they have to ask for advice then? Yeah, sometimes when you ask a gadol, you know, listen, listen Rabbanu Shalom, I'm asking, I'm asking the right address. But we have to know, even Moshe Rabbeinu is not allowed to testify about himself or his family. Because it's endemic in human nature that there's a self-interest. And it doesn't allow us to see straight. Once we recognize that, then we're on the road to being able to get the right advice. Guys, I forgot, it's Rosh Chodesh. Should have brought with Lachaim. A little Mazenus. Every Rosh Chodesh we have a little party. But it didn't happen. We'll take a rain check. Okay? The Lachaim dance. <laughs> now next time we have to continue about to fill in, so we get together next time Monday. Monday is the next year because it's an off Shabbos, so it's the Sunday. It's an off Shabbos. It's an off Shabbos. So Monday is this year. What we'll do is on Monday we're going to be talking about to fill in. We'll get a little bit more deeper insight. We began, but we didn't get into it a little bit more, and we'll see if we can get a little better appreciation of what those black boxes are and how they connect us to the upper realms send some good waves down here see if we can figure something out great thank you everyone thank you Eddie have a great day you too Josh